What's up, everyone? So I've been getting a lot of questions about uh, beginners um, and if beginners should train differently than more advanced trainees. And I'm going to show you where this uh, belief comes from. So there is a, there's an origin of the belief that beginners, intermediate, advanced, and elite trainees somehow need to train differently. In a way where a beginner routine is less intense, uh, where a beginner routine is more basic. And then as you start to become advanced, the advanced routine is gonna be a little more complex. It's gonna be a little more exercise. It's gonna be a little more volume, a little more frequency under the wrong, and I mean completely wrong to the point where it's backwards belief that more advanced individuals need more exercise. Okay. Now, this could be the result of not understanding the basic fundamentals of progressive exercise, progressive overload. And if you don't understand the basic fundamentals, productive exercise, what well, can you lead you down a super long path of misunderstanding everything else? So I think where this comes from, the belief that advanced trainees need more exercise, more complicated exercise, is based on a bunch of already false assumptions about exercise. So when you take an individual and you have them do a beginner and you have them do just about anything, the body's going to respond instantly. Because the, the body is very sensitive when it's deconditioned and untrained. It's very sensitive to any sort of muscular stress. It's going to adapt very quickly. A great analogy for this is like, um, you know, say, you know, uh, referring to the United States, say you live in the Northeast. And, uh, you know, from about November all the way to April, it's dark cold, gloomy, there's not much sunlight. So your skin doesn't receive much exposure to ultraviolet light. And then a lot of people in the Northeast come in vacation down here in Florida um, in the spring. And they'll notice <laughs> only about five or 10 minutes in the sunlight to start to burn. Okay. And it's because their skin hasn't been exposed to ultraviolet light in so long that it's become very sensitive to it. It's become very sensitive to the stress of UV rays. Your body's the same way. If your body has not been exposed um, ever or for quite a long time to muscular stress, it's going to respond almost instantly. It needs very little. So if your body's in a deconditioned atrophied state, no training or even very little training, it takes almost nothing to get the needle moving forward again. Um, and that's a, a lot of the reason people see such drastic gains in the beginning is because when you're entering an exercise program from an atrophy deconditioned state, the body responds very quickly. Because to get out of that deconditioned state, it doesn't take all that much. So I think this is part of where the belief that Beginners require a more basic program and advanced trainees require a more complicated one. Um, and, and it's true that beginners require very basic training. But the confusion is it's also true that advanced trainees also require very basic training. And in more cases than not, less basic. So you've probably heard me say a bunch of times, like, as time goes on, your ability to inroad and fatigue your muscles deeply and the amount of stress you accumulate for each set, each exercise, and each workout increases the more advanced you get, the stronger you get. So as time goes on and you've added muscle tissue, you've learned how to contract your muscles harder. Um, you're going to be cre creating, and you're using more load, you're going to be creating more stress per workout as you get more advanced. But 
your body's ability to recover from exercise stress is pretty much fixed. It improves a little bit in the beginning, but then you pretty much hit a ceiling, which means each workout as you get more advanced becomes more stressful and usually requires either more recovery time or a reduction in volume. When I first started doing high intensity training, I was training two to three times a week. and I could handle it. Now I'm at the point where I can, I can really only train once every five to seven days and not feel completely run down. Um, and the reason is, you know, once you've been doing this for so long, each repetition, each set is so intense and so stressful, so fatiguing on your body that you end up more quickly reaching a point of overtraining and diminishing returns as you get more advanced. And I have myself and every other good high intensity training coach, practitioner, whatever has noticed this phenomenon in your records. So in my studios, most of the time I would start people off twice a week. After about eight weeks, we'd have to cut it back. We'd have to cut back the volume almost in every case. Most of the time what would happen is I would have people do a basic full body exercise, two pulling movements, two pushing movements, horizontal, vertical, legs, uh, hamstrings, lower back, abdominals. And in almost every case, I had to reduce the volume in their workouts or else they would be completely burnt out and come to a full halt in progress. So what I would normally do is remove an exercise from a workout and alternate them. Workout one, we would do a pull down, chest press, overhead press. Workout two, we would do a row, chest press, overhead press. Or we do a pull down row chest press or pull down row overhead press. Most of the time what I found was the pulling movements resulted in a quicker or more overtraining than the pushing movements. So a lot of the times I reduced their exercise, their workouts to just one pulling movement. And then they started to progress again. So the belief that advanced trainees need more is wrong. It's wrong if you are adhering to the proper application of effective progressive exercise. And in order for exercise to be effective over the long term, it must be progressive. You must overload. Most training programs especially with like advanced trainees or athletes or whatever, many of them, I don't know if most of them, I can't say that for sure, but many of them are not progressive in nature. It's kind of the same hopping around, throwing kettlebells, flipping tire bullshit day after day after day with no progression or progressive overload um, calculated into it. If that's the case, if you're doing the same activity without any sort of progression or progressive overload implemented into it, you're going to need more. Or you're going to seem like you need more because it's going to feel easier over time. For instance, if I do 15 tractor tire flips and 20 kettlebell swings three times a week for two weeks, Eventually, I'm going to get to the point where my nervous system is adapted to, to where that, that's not very stressful on my body. I made a small improvement in cardiovascular, metabolic efficiency, and muscle strength, but a lot of it's neuromuscular. So over time, those 15 tractor tires and 20 kettlebell swings are going to become easier. And I'm going to notice that I can tolerate more. So I'm going to add more. Because you're doing this the same way. In the same activity. Now, what you would want to do ideally is add resistance with a lot of those things, but many of the times people don't. So what they do is they add volume. And this is what um, leads people to believe that advanced trainees need more because they are not making their workouts progressive in nature. 
So therefore, in order for them to be somewhat difficult, because they're adapting over time, neuromuscularly mostly, they need to add volume. They need to add exercises. They need to add frequency. So this is kind of where this comes from. Part of this also comes from um, ACSM recommendations. Okay, so the, the American College of Sports Medicine, and I go, over, I go over this research a lot, American College of Sports Medicine recommends that beginners, intermediate, advanced, and what they call elite uh, trainees need to manipulate the training variables to continue to see results. But the problem is, when you look at the recommendation and the evidence they support for it, none of their evidence holds up. Um, I'm going to show you that. Advanced. Let's see. So... If you guys have questions, go ahead and you know keep posting questions. Um, I'm just gonna try to find a piece of the uh, I'm sure it says. So here it is. So again, this is a paper by you know, a few exercise scientists who examined ACSM position stands on resistance training. So part of their, their position stand is that The position stand states that its purpose is to provide guidelines for progression in intermediate trainees who are defined in the position stand as those with approximately six months of consistent resistance training. For advanced trainees with three years of resistance training and for elite athletes who are highly trained to compete at the highest levels. Given the way the ACSM has defined and categorized their target populations, intermediate, advanced, and elite trainees, the reader should expect that the position stand would first cite evidence to support their assumption that the target populations require training programs different from beginning programs, and then present supporting evidence, you know, peer-reviewed resistance training studies, for recommendations that are drawn exclusively from those specific demographics. Neither obligation is filled, is fulfilled in the position stand, thereby rendering the majority of the claims in the position stand so the thing is this belief comes from ACSM position stands which again um, influence the curriculum that is taught to trainers the curriculum that is taught to coaches okay? so the coaches go to college the trainers take their certification and they're taught okay advanced trainees have to train like this intermediate have to train like this and beginners have to train like so they're taught this. And they're taught this by an institution who provides the curriculum. But the, the belief that the institution, so the institution creates curriculum based on a phenomenon that beginners, intermediate, advanced, and elite people need to train differently. But this phenomenon has no evidence behind it. That's the problem. So the ACSM teaches, coaches, teaches, trainers, the curriculum, whatever. Say, well, everyone has to train different based on your experience or whatever. But that belief is not based on any evidence at all. So the reason people believe beginners have to train differently than more advanced athletes, more advanced trainees, whatever, it's because coaches and personal trainers were taught that in their education, not realizing that that belief has no evidence. And this is the problem, because a personal trainer or a coach goes to get their education, get their CSCS certification, their 
fucking useless PhD in exercise science, which is no fucking reason it even exists. And then they say, you know, they're teaching people. Well, beginners should train this way. Adventurities should train this way. That's what I learned in college. Without realizing what they learned in college was based on no evidence at all and complete bullshit. And if you look at um, the research, to my knowledge, there has not been any research comparing advanced, intermediate, and beginners with the same volume and frequency and determined which is more effective. Believe it or not, from what I've seen, and from what many, many coaches have seen, very elite athletes respond very well to very basic routines. Because the goal of an exercise is simple, or of a workout is simple. Address every major muscle group in the body, pretty much involved in gross movement patterns, provide a huge amount of resistance against them, in order to generate a deep level of fatigue and thereby stress to stimulate an adaptive response, muscle growth, muscle strength. And when you look at the purpose of a workout in that way, it becomes obvious that it's very simple to do that. Gross movement patterns, horizontal push, horizontal pull, work all the muscles, train hard. Complicating workouts does nothing beneficial. People who complicate workouts with more complicated exercise that require more balance, more skill, simply distract from the purpose of the workout, which is to generate deep fatigue and thereby stress. They distract from that goal with the balancing and the skill with the false belief that the skill associated in these stupid dogs with the assumption that the skill that you improve in these exercises, such as if you do a, like a, a squat on a medicine ball and you're able to balance the assumption that that skill is going to transfer to something is wrong. It does. So, so here are the here are the basic facts on beginner versus advanced trainees. The workouts will look almost identical, and in many cases, advanced trainees will will require less exercise because they will be creating more stress as they become more advanced, and their ability to recover from that stress does not. Matter. All right. So, I'm going to go over some questions that were emailed to me about beginners. And advanced trainees. I'll look at some uh, questions first. Can muscular endurance be built with one set to failure? Um, let me answer this by asking you a question. What do you mean by muscular endurance? So when I say yes, um, you have to understand the actual meaning of muscular endurance. There's something called local muscular endurance. But what local muscular endurance is, is not probably what you are referring to muscular endurance as. So if you are referring to muscular endurance as your ability to jog or swim or bike, well, that is not the correct definition of muscular endurance. That is specific endurance for a specific activity. If you become very proficient and increase your endurance at jogging, you can try this if you want. It will not transfer to your conditioning and your endurance with swimming. It will not transfer to your conditioning and endurance with biking. Because stamina and endurance for activities like this, a lot of it is neuromuscular in nature and your uh, economy of movement Efficiency, neuromuscular efficiency improves, and that's what makes them easier. And then people who don't know any better see this as muscular endurance. It's not. 
is neuromuscular efficiency improvements. So local muscular endurance can be built by training to failure. But if you want endurance or stamina in specific activities, since a lot of that is neuromuscular in nature, you have to practice the specific activity. Okay. Why are some people saying you never get on the schedule calls you give, you get, give with your program? Guys, keep in mind with these calls, these are not free coaching calls. Okay, you need to read. When you go to the page that says about the call, the call is if you are interested in joining the coaching program. Okay, a lot of people when they they get the golden era system and they book the call with me, they think that the call comes with golden era system. That is not how this that works. That would be literally impossible. I've sold thousands of these golden era systems. To do a 45 minute call with each one is physically impossible. So guys, remember when you buy golden era system, read, <laughs> actually read the fucking page. It says, are you interested in working one-on-one -on -one with Jay? Book a call to see if private coaching is good for you or works for you. That's what they're for. People have been getting the wrong impression about the calls, thinking they're just free coaching calls that come with the program. Guys, hell no. I do not have the time to do that. Um, so if you book, you know, it, I mean, it, I mean, how could I possibly have sold thousands of these things? So if you are interested in learning more about the coaching program, book the call. The call does not come with golden era system. Okay. That would just be, that would be insane. Who would have the time for that? <laughs> how could you do that? So a lot of the times what I do is I, so I'll, I'll, I have somebody who goes through the appointments and sees which ones are, you know, people are interested in um, the coaching and they book the call. I'm going to yell at my stupid dog. So, you know, if you fill out the form and it doesn't look like you're interested in coaching and you just, you know, just want you know, call just to, you know, pick my brain. I, I don't have the mental energy for that, guys. <laughs> I couldn't possibly. God, I have a migraine by APM usually just off the shit I do. So um, that's the thing about the coaching calls. All right. Using your program, is it okay to switch to 10 to 15 reps for all exercise instead of 8 to 12? Yes. Reps don't really matter. Jay, who would you define a beginner? Who is a beginner? I would define a beginner as somebody who has never consistently done strength training. Somebody who's you know done it for like a week and then not done it for two years. Somebody who's never done it at all. Someone who has not consistently um, engaged in strength training for you know, several months at a time. That would be. Would you say someone can expect to run a successful personal training business without being super jacked? Yes. I train hard and want to study exercise personal stuff. Yes, you could. Being in very good shape helps, um, but it's not necessary. Um, if you can, if you can get people to see that you know what you're talking about you will build a successful personal training business. But I think uh, people are under the impression that building a personal training business is easy or that, or that it happens quickly. It does not. It is not easy and it does not happen quickly. So a lot of the times people start it, they take two, three months, they notice uh, they don't have 50 clients a week and then they give up thinking that they're entitled to getting clients that quickly. No, per starting personal training business is hard because there are a million personal trainers out there. So you got to figure, why would they hire you versus someone else? What are you going to give them that someone else can't? 
And that's what you need to focus on. Um, you need to focus on what's going to separate you from all these other trainers and then kind of market yourself that way. That's, that's the, the basics of it. What do you recommend for someone who has tendon stiffness? The tendons, ligaments surrounding the coracoid process reaching the front shoulder. Um, well, is this stiffness affecting any sort of daily activity? Did you injure a particular area? Um, let's see. It's, it's probably not tendon stiffness. It's probably, you know, it's probably got to do with muscles, stiffness in the tendons, ligaments, surrounding. You know, I don't know. There, you know, I'd have to, we'd have to talk a lot more about that to figure that one out. All right, drop sets. Yeah, about drop sets. Um, it really depends. I think drop sets can be, can be useful to people if they're not training as intensely as they could be. And they're just not really aware of it. But if you are training really hard, drop sets are not going to make any additional difference. How many years of training did you stop seeing increases in mass? Um, so you're, you're going to pretty much see the most of your muscle growth within the first year of training. And by the end of the second year, you're probably much, you're probably not going to see much more. So I was, um, you know, I started, I think, training when I was 16, 16, 17, consistently, never stopped. When I was about 22, 22, 23, the best I did was about 191, 192 pounds doing the traditional stuff. It wasn't until I switched to high intensity training principles that I added mass. And it took about, you know, I went from 192, 191, 192 to about 203 to 205 in about five months. And then I stayed there forever. And um, then just recently over the course year, or over last year, I went from about 207 to 215. What did I do differently? No idea. Honestly, the, the, the only thing I did differently was train, <laughs> you're not gonna believe it, train less frequently. As strange as it sounds, the only thing I did differently last in the last year or so is training less frequently. Uh, could be a stress thing, could be a sleep thing. I didn't really change my diet. Well, one of the huge reasons was too was um, you know during during I think I explained this for like during football season, you know, football games are on every week, and I would find myself drinking beer casual with my friends watching football. And I think the alcohol had a negative impact. And then I kind of cut it out once football season ended and my body grew. That's the only thing I could really figure. I wasn't like measuring anything. I wasn't trying to get bigger. I just kind of did. Athletes have a shorter lifespan than the average population. That is true. A lot of people believe that Athletes are healthy, but it, it, actually the opposite is true. Athletes are pushing their bodies to the absolute limits, and that is not healthy. Maybe for marathon runner, what other athletes? NFL athletes actually have very low life expectancies. Um, I won't say it was like 57 years. Average lifespan, NFL player. All right. The consensus is that the average life expectancy of an NFL player is between 53 and 
59 years of age. And, you know, that, you know, that makes sense because you, you got to remember the abuse from probably 15, 14, 10 years old that they're putting themselves through. And you got to remember, too, so, yeah, the, well, that's what they said. I don't know if it's based on, but it makes sense. Um, let's see if they have any citations at the bottom. The average, I think the average lifespan of a, a regular people is like 80, right? So, yeah, it's it's low. So uh, there's a couple of reasons I think that happens. First of all, they're beating the shit out of their body constantly. Okay, that stress, that systemic stress for years. Even though the average, I think the average NFL career is about two years. <laughs> it's not a good career choice. You know, they're beating themselves up from eight years old. Until 30. I think also the majority of NFL players are huge, right? I think that very large people, you know, unusually large people, who are just are unusually huge, unusually muscular, unusually large, generally don't live as long. I think that's part of it too. So if you look at the NFL, we're, we're talking about, you know, you know, 15, 20 uh, NFL linemen per team. You know, the, the linemen are all 6'3", six, three, three, six, three to 6'8", six, 300 pounds. These are very large people. Very large people like that don't live very long. Even, uh, you know, NFL linebackers, talking like six foot to 6'3", 250 pounds, you know, People that are that large have lower lifespans. Could be part of it. Let's see. I'm going to have a good chest press machine. Can push ups and chest fly optimally load my muscles? Yes, it's not the exercise. So uh, I've said this before the reason people place so much emphasis on what exercise is best is because of YouTube, Instagram, fitness bullshit. Content creators have no fucking clue what they're talking about. And their goal is to just create content. So they say, here's the best exercise for the inner chest. Here's the best exercise for the fucking upper, outer, inner, deep, superficial fucking deltoid. Because they, they, they need to create content. They have nothing else to talk about. The exercise, as long as it addresses the primary function of the muscle, is optimal. In terms of growth, is it optimal in terms of safety or time efficiency? Well, that's another story. But if you are addressing the function of the muscle, the primary function of that muscle group, and you are contracting that muscle hard, progressively, um, high intensity of effort to failure, or at least very close, it's going to be optimal for growth. A chest press versus a chest fly versus a bench press versus a dumbbell chest press, they're all equally effective in terms of growth. Some um, exercises are safer. Chest press is going to be safer than a dumbbell press. Some exercises are more efficient. A selectorized with the pin chest press is going to be a heck of a lot more efficient and the bench press, weights on, all oh, 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 that bullshit. But the belief that some exercises are, are noticeably superior in terms of stimulating muscle growth than others is, is just bullshit. It's bullshit. I mean, look at, you know, look at the guys, you know, from the 70s, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, Robbie Robinson, Serge Nubert. They didn't, they didn't have machines. <laughs> These are the most basic exercises in the world. If you've ever seen pumping iron, they, they had like cables and they had dumbbells and barbells. They built great physiques. It's not the, it's not the exercise, it's not the machine. There, there's no such thing as all these silly ass exercises they have now back then. They built great physiques. You know, it's the genetics, the intensity, whatever. Um, It'd be a good idea to use machines because they're more efficient and they're safer. That's all.
Let's see. Heard you have biceps tendon issues. Yeah, my distal biceps. Is there a good hit exercise for someone who's trying to rehab a proximal short head biceps tendon irritation or injury? The belief that exercises accelerate the injury healing process is wrong. Okay. Exercises will help rebuild the strength in the connective tissue or in the muscle after it is fully healed. But this physical therapy bullshit that you need to do exercises for the healing process is wrong. You don't want to do anything for it. You want to let it heal first and then strengthen it. And there isn't any specific exercise that is going to be best for strengthening it other than just basic exercises with low momentum. There's, there's nothing you're going to do really for, for a, an inflamed tendon. So tendonitis is tendon inflammation. It's inflamed. Why? Mostly probably shearing forces, uh, force, momentum. You, know, you put too much force on a tendon, you're going to cause micro trauma in that tendon. That's going to produce inflammation. Tendonitis, that inflammation is going to cause pain, irritation. You've got to wait for that inflammation to go down um, in order to make it stronger again. Attempting to stimulate you know, the tendons and muscles when they're all inflamed is just going to send you in the wrong direction. So it's really how much you can do other than just let it heal. What I do when my biceps tendons get sore and inflamed and whatever, I take ibuprofen and I just don't do any curls or any pulling movements. Don't heal. In my muscle tech photo, um, I was about 205. I was leaner back then. <laughs> All right, anyone here do sprint eight? Okay. The belief that exercise releases immense amounts of growth hormone is wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. There is no evidence at all that shows a substantial release of growth hormone as a result of exercise. Anyone who says that is lying. They are lying. I'll show you. People say that to make their, their workouts uh, more appealing. Um, But it's a lie. It is an absolute lie that any sort of training stimulates a huge amount of growth hormone release. Just think of how fucking stupid that sounds. Stupid. Um, let's see. There's So this is a, a paper that kind of goes into this. They're looking at the evidence of the actual mechanisms that stimulate muscle growth. And they found when they were looking at hormones. There's a belief that exercise produces huge amounts of hormones and that results. In. So anabolic hormones, testosterone, growth hormones, various isoforms, the concentrations of which are moderately, usually well within diurnal variation, the hormone and transiently increased for 15 to 30 minutes after resistance exercise have been proposed to be internal stimuli have a positive role in muscle growth. However, despite numerous studies designed to probe this question directly, our group and others have found no support for this thesis that acute changes in anabolic hormones induced by resistance exercise are me mechanistically responsible for skeletal muscle hypertrophy or increments in muscle protein synthesis. Um, which group? Uh, let's see, hypothesis for the potential role 
acute changes in anabolic hormones mediating stimulus, which originate from the observation that resistance exercise is effective physiological stimulus for growth hormone during your REV exercise session. Serum growth hormone levels increase 10 to 20 minutes after initiation and peak at the end of resistance exercise, returning to baseline about 30 minutes post resistance exercise. <laughs> so the guy's fucking lying. A relevant question is whether growth hormone is immediate or muscle growth at all. For example, GH infusion studies mimicking the response to resistance exercise show stimulation of muscle protein synthesis and decrement in muscle protein breakdown. However, resistance exercise induced increase in serum GH was not associated with muscle protein synthesis. So, this is a lie. Okay. People like to say things like that because it's, uh, oh, I found this way to in, induce so much growth hormone, you're going to look like fucking Barry Bonds in a year. No. Same holds true for testosterone. Yes, testoster or testosterone is increased as a result of exercise. Your um, testosterone levels will increase over time as a result of exercise. But it's not... A, 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 in a way where you would notice something substantial, right? So watch out for this stuff, guys. Um, you know, you could, it's really easy to debunk this stuff. But how long does the muscle growth supercompensation occur after recovery and healing is completed? Depends on the individual. Depends completely on the individual. Should you train if you have a sore throat? Yep, you'll be fine. Should you train if you have a fever? No. Don't train if you have a fever. Let's see. It's hard to forego training for more than 48 hours, so I just decreased exercises from four to six, two to three per session. I reestablished my progress margin for fishing again. Yeah, you can do that. At what point does one go from beginner to intermediate? Who the fuck knows? I mean, these, these terms even mean anything. They're like, what's an intermediate? Yeah, I think that question was asked earlier. Like, how do you define intermediate? I don't define intermediate as anything. I say you're a beginner if you've never really trained before. And if you've been training for a couple of years, you're advanced. I'm not going to put a numerical value to it, though. Let's see. When tendonitis generate, or degenerates into tendinosis, inflammation subsides, won't there be some scar tissue that causes pain that should work through head? I don't know. I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, so my knowledge of rehabbing joint injuries is pretty limited. Um, That'd be a question for an orthopedic surgeon. I, don't, I focus on, you know, I know a little bit about like the rehab stuff, but I'm not a rehab guy. Um, I'm not an orthopedic surgeon. Um, I focus on strength training, building muscle, losing fat, stuff like that. So I don't dabble in this kind of stuff. I didn't go to medical school to learn about. Um, Orthopedic surgery. That'd be a question for them. Huh, look at this. Down under. Where's down under? <laughs> Where do you live? How? <laughs> About going there, system several months ago. I went from not being able to do a single chin up to doing five slow chin ups in a few weeks, for example. There you go. I saw an interview with you on YouTube from like four or five years ago and your biceps were taking up half the room. My biceps are bigger now than they were four or five years ago. Way bigger. Way, way, way bigger. What are you doing differently than now? Nothing. Not really. I'm a lot bigger. I'm 10 pounds heavier than I was five years ago. All right, a couple more. Crazy dog. All right, let's see. let's see. Orthodox Christians fast no meat, 
dairy for 40 days before Christmas and Easter. What would you recommend to eat during that period? Uh, Lactose-free protein shakes. <laughs> That's really all I can think of. No, it's tough. Probably, yeah, probably like... Um, I mean, would you consider a whey protein shake dairy? That, that's tough. That's tough. I mean, it kind of depends on you know what you consider. Uh, getting protein would be tough for forty days. Um, but here's the thing: if for, if for some reason for forty days you're gonna like optimal protein, who cares? You know, after forty days, start eating normal protein. You know, I grew up as Catholic. We never ate meat on Fridays. We had fish. So does, uh, I'm not sure, does fish count? Uh, because even to this day, I mean, we, even throughout Christmas too, there's no meat, there's only fish. So <clears throat> we ate fish as Italian Americans. Uh, if you could eat that, that'd be the best way to do it. All right, does getting, ooh, does getting a pump do absolutely anything? Does it build more blood cells as some people say? No, <laughs> who says that? I don't know, build more blood cells? What? No, the, the pump is a result of um, basically it's a result of your an exchange between intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid. The extracellular fluid goes into the cell, the cell swells, you get a pump, uh, blood vessel dilation, vessel dilation, that's part of it. But no, it doesn't build more blood cells. Man, people come up with some crazy shit, don't they? <clears throat> right, let's see. I ski in the winter. How would you recommend I implement strength training to practice still skiing? Mark Sinovich said they would strength train the day after game. What do you think? Um, well, okay, they would strength train the day after a game because that fit that NFL schedule best. Uh, but in your case, I would strength train, take a day off completely, one or two, and then you can ski. Just do them on different days. That's all. Can I train legs every 10 to 12 days and will it be enough for optimal growth? I don't know because I don't know how you respond to training. That's what my coaching is for. By the way, guys, if you want to join my coaching group, where you learn all this stuff in way more detail. We go through studies, we do live workouts. I do my workouts live. I take people, my clients, I take them through the workouts live. Um, I'll show you that in a second, actually. Uh, click the link in the bio to join coaching. So if you have a question like this, I don't know. No, because I haven't seen your progress. I haven't talked to you. I don't know anything about you. So I, I, I don't know. Will you see growth training legs every 10, 12 days? Yes. Will it be optimal? I don't know. I don't know. If you go out in the sun for 30 minutes right now, will you see a suntan? Sure. Maybe. Will it be optimal? I don't know. Are you Scandinavian or are you Puerto Rican? You know, it's like, we don't know. We don't know. All right, let's see. The consensus of exercise science seems to show that muscle protein synthesis drops off at 24 to 48 hours and sometimes even less toward 24 hours. Why does it so slow frequency still work so well? Um... Because just because muscle protein synthesis is elevated does not mean it's elevated enough to cause muscle growth. So there's a there's there's a window where pro muscle protein synthesis is elevated enough to produce muscle hypertrophy, but muscle protein synthesis can still stay elevated for a long period of time, um, but not necessarily causing muscle growth. So the belief that you need to get to the gym and get muscle protein synthesis up immediately for optimal muscle growth is wrong because that's just one part of the equation. Um, because the muscle protein synthesis has to be elevated enough to cause muscle growth. So and here's the other thing. The consensus of exercise science seems to show that muscle protein synthesis drops off 24 to 48 hours and sometimes even less 24 hours. Well, 
What's going to affect that? Your calorie intake? Believe it or not, your carb intake. Your protein intake. Your training intensity. So when studies show this, you, you, guys, your muscle protein synthesis drops off while you're sleeping. Like it does this all day. You, you shouldn't be focused on muscle protein synthesis. Those kinds of things are not going to make a difference. Um, I think the reason why hit with such low frequency still works so well is because the intensity of the stress is so much greater. So a lot of times when they're studying muscle protein synthesis, they're doing typical three sets of 10, not huge intensity of effort. And that's how it affects it differently. Me and Drew Bay, uh, one of our interviews, we went over this. Watch those interviews with Drew Bay. I'm pretty sure we go over that kind of a lot of detail. Oh, down under is Australia. Okay. No fish, but shellfish. Yeah, you know, I would just... Whatever. A YouTuber named Bioneer said it in one of his videos, too. No, people are weird. Is a trunk extension exercise like glute bridge or deadlift a good addition to big five of light press or is it redundant? Can be redundant for some people, could be a good addition for some people. It's going to kind of be based on you. Why did Dorian do three exercises per body part? Well, Dorian, first of all, took a lot of anabolic steroids so he could tolerate three exercises per body part. We went over this. Also, Dorian actually did a lot more than he needed, but he didn't know that at the time. He probably still didn't realize that he could have gotten the same physique with less exercises. But what he was doing was working. <clears throat> How did he change it? Have you found an average amount of rest days for your clients? <clears throat> yeah, an average of two, two to three. Two to three seems to be fine for most people. Most people. Some people do more. Some people less. So actually, let me show you guys, since I brought it up, this is what we do in my coaching group. Um, if you guys want direct help from me on a daily basis, where I dial in your diet and your training with you, that's what the coaching is for. We also do two group calls a week. Um, and they're all recorded, and we go very deep, two to three hours, on all kinds of different subjects. So if you're stuck, you're not growing muscle, you're not seeing the results you want, join my coaching, and we'll get you the results you want. Because chances are you're missing something, and you need coaching. So I'm going to show you kind of what the coaching looks like. We actually did a cool call the other day. So in the coaching program, you get access to this website. So all these videos that explain things. You know, they're you know, diet nutrition basics. We go into all this stuff. This is stuff you can do on your own. But then we have, obviously, a bunch of exercise demonstration videos. A lot of them, which are still golden there. But if you click two, if you go all the way down, we have group coaching calls. And I have coaching calls going back a year, going over everything you could think about. Um, the recent one we did was common training beliefs debunk with research proof. So you can tell, um, you know, I'll take my clients to workouts. See, here's Eon going through a workout. Here's Robbie going through a workout. <laughs> Breathe and drop to a. Uh, so I kind of like take you through the workout and train you. And this kind of helps people learn training. If you're training at home or you have a nice quiet gym, I can take workouts. So that's coaching. Coaching is much more in depth. Um, and we also, let's so tell this one's, that one's just a workout, but four minutes long. Mobility training, go over this kind of stuff. You know, 
they're they're quite long. They're quite long. They do over all kinds of kinds of things. So you know, if you want to become you know, an expert in exercise and get personal help, that's what the coaching is for. Click the link in the description. A lot of people were under the impression that by Golden Era system it comes with a coaching call. Guys, no, no, there's no way anybody can have the time for that. Um, so that's not how that works. So, you know, if you, you know, book a call after buying Golden Era and my appointment person kind of determines that you're not really interested in coaching, you just want to call. My appointment person is just going to See, I'm gonna answer like one more, one or two more. Let's see. It'd be interested. It'd be interesting to see project synthesis elevation time frame on your clients with Brad Schoenfeld. Yeah, I mean, you know, you've seen videos of Brad Schoenfeld training someone. It's way different. <laughs> it's not even. It's like apples to oranges. You know, these are the things like when you're looking at exercise research, the, the one thing you always got to think about, it's like, okay, how are they training? Are they training golden air system, high intensity training? Are they training hard, real hard? If they're not, nothing in that study is really going to apply. Do you think overhead triceps work is necessary for maximum development of the triceps long head? No. But I have found that sometimes working muscles in extended or short positions allow people to train the muscles harder, sometimes. Um, but without them, I don't, I don't think you'd be missing any growth. Like, you know, Dorian Yates, for instance, Mike Mentor, they never trained the biceps and triceps, and, you know, um, extended or contracted positions. And they developed just fine. <laughs> you know, they won some of the competition. So, do you think forms can be hit with a little more frequency? Why do you want to hit them with a little more frequency? Increasing frequency doesn't seem to have a noticeable effect on muscle growth. So although you can hit your forearms with more frequency, will they grow more? No. Was Mike Mentor right that growth happens only after systemic fatigue subsides? Um, I don't know. Maybe. Sounds like it makes sense. Um, I think if you're you know, chronically stressed, chronically fatigued, yeah, I know, it makes sense. What should I replace lat pull down pull ups if they hurt my shoulder? Do a horizontal row. It'll work all the same muscles. And I don't know. Your shoulder might hurt because of the way you're doing it, though. So. All right, guys, that's going to be it for me. Um, again, if you want to join coaching, we meet twice a week for two to three hours, group calls. Um, you get unlimited access to me on a daily basis, walking through a diet, walking training and you see much better results so if you really want really good results click the link join the coaching if you haven't gotten the golden era system yet i'll give away the home workout in the arm program for free as i usually do when i do these live streams so go to golden era system.com and get the golden era system remember when you get the Golden Air system and ask if you'd like to book a call, remember these are not coaching calls that come with Golden Air. Some people, for some reason, believe that. They are calls if you're interested in learning more about the coaching program in addition to Golden Air. Okay? Why have you stopped drinking Bud Light? <laughs> I never drink Bud Light. <laughs> Ever. Don't drink Bud Light. It tastes like monkey piss out of that. All right, guys, we'll see you later. GoldenAirSystem.com. Click the link for coaching, like, subscribe, and I'll see you soon.